Bible so mad. Let me come back and preach to you again. The job must have been bad somewhere along the line, is all I can tell you. Three things for you this morning before we start. I am Gary Campbell. I'm from New Covenant United Methodist Church just over the valley here for a little piece of law. And I'm a little different. You have to understand that, please. If you're visiting here for the first time, don't hold this against the church. Uh, I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church, saved, baptized, called, preached, college educated, seminary educated, all within the Southern Baptist Convention. Then in 2000, God called me to a Presbyterian church in Clearwater as their director of Christian education and congregational development. My, that's my area of expertise is Christian education. And then after five years there, Gary Willett called me to New Covenant United Methodist Church in the building just to do Christian education and a few other little odds and ends here and there. So that makes me, by faith, a Methabacterian. <laughs> I'll let you figure that out as we get. Second thing is, I have had a tremendous problem with my sciatic nerve all of a sudden for about two weeks, and I cannot stand it very long. That's why I'm seeing so. The other thing about that is the medication I'm taking for that makes my mouth feel like the Sahara Desert. And so I'm, if I start spitting cotton, you will know why. Just the way things are and what we live with. Now, I have three different titles for this sermon this morning in the fifth chapter of Revelation. The first one was Signed, Sealed, Delivered, It's Yours. But I didn't know if everybody would know who Stevie Wonder was, so I threw that one out. <laughs> I started to call it What Happens When All Heaven Breaks Loose, but I'm afraid somebody would get that confused and say something the wrong word there when they went to say what the title of the sermon was, and I'd get in trouble again. I stay in trouble a lot. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about this morning is Worthy is the Lamb. Now this sermon series that Michael has right now is called Postcards from the Throne Room, and we are in the throne room today. Let me ask you this before we start, though. How many of you remember your first kiss? Do you? All right, yeah, that's great. I love that. I still remember the first kiss with my wife. It was five minutes before that, we were simply the best friends that had ever been and spent a lot of time together. And then we had our first kiss, and things changed dramatically for 41 years now. How do you explain that? You know, you can check the dictionary. And it says that a kiss is a caress with the lips, a gentle touch, or contact. But does that really capture the essence of what a kiss is? Does it capture the essence of the mother when she tenderly places her lips on her forehead of her children as she puts them to bed at night? Does it fully explain the content of when a man kisses his spouse, or wife kisses her spouse, in that moment it comes together? Any experience that you try to explain as a kiss we just, it's just not enough, is it? It has to be experienced. Our attempts to fully define and explain God are just as futile. We can say something about Him, but we can never fully define Him. We can, however, know that Him, through the experience of His revelation of Himself, to us in His words and in the person of Jesus Christ. And then looking at the book of Revelation, today we're in Revelation 5, in both chapters 4 and 5, the scenes of heaven. In chapter 4, we experience the worship of God the Father. In chapter 5, we will experience the worship of Jesus the Christ. These two chapters provide us a key whole glimpse of what will be going on in heaven before God tours out His judgments later on in the book. So the first thing I want you to notice is this. God is in complete control of the future. Now, if you've got your Bibles, I hope your Bibles open to this passage because we're going to be looking at uh, I preached to, last time I was with you, I preached a topical sermon, which meant I took a topic and I preached it from a lot of different places. This is expository. I'm going to preach, I'm going to walk you through the fifth chapter of Revelation, okay? So, you want to have your Bible open. God is in complete control of the future. John records in verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Now, we're focusing in chapter 4 on our attention on the throne. Chapter 5 begins by drawing our attention to a scroll. In God the Father's right hand, and John saw a scroll there. What's more profound way of picturing God's sovereignty and God's will than this picture of this scroll resting in His hand. However strong evil becomes, however fierce the satanic evils of the world are that assail God's people on earth, history still rests in God's hand for all time. God's right hand refers to His authority to translate the contents of His scroll into action. 
The scroll is the focus of John's attention in this chapter. It is what Jesus Christ opens in chapter 6, resulting in the judgments that will come upon the earth. The scroll contains the detailed plans and purposes of God for subduing the enemies of Christ and establishing His reign upon the earth. This scroll is so full of words that John can see right in on the inside as well on the outside of the scroll. Very unique. Nowhere in the Old Testament do you find that usually where the scroll is written on the back and forth because usually just laid it out and run across it and then sealed it up. But in Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel says, Then I looked and saw a hand stretched out to me, and it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me on both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. This did, the writing on both sides indicates the detailed and important nature of these judgments. It also emphasizes their ability to accomplish the purpose of God. God had sealed this with seven seals. That suggests the profound nature of the revelation it contained. It may represent the book of prophecies that God instructed Daniel to seal until the ends of time. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, then verse 9. He says, But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. He replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the end of time. So God has sealed some things until the end of time. He says the perfect number of seven is sealed here. This hints at the absolute sacredness of the scroll. The scroll informs us that while his plan has been settled in the eternal counsels of God, it has been concealed, and only one who is duly authorized may open it and read it and execute it. The period of grace in God's long suffering has come to an end. John is mesmerized by God the Father of the scroll in his right hand when he sees chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, a strong angel. A strong angel. He doesn't give us his name. Maybe Gabriel who ordered the closing and the sealing of the book of Daniel. And his name means strength of God. Or it could be Michael who will play a major role in end time events. But he said a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. This indicates authority and the importance of what he says. The term loud voice occurs 20 times in the book of Revelation. Then the angel says, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seal? No one in heaven or the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. This unnamed angel asked the question of all the ages that all men won't answer at one time or another. Who is worthy to open the book? Who is worthy to break, our seal, break the seals? What was sufficient authority and worthiness was necessary to open the scroll? And by breaking its seals and list the judgment upon earth that it contained. Any prophet could have revealed this information. But it took someone with adequate power to execute this information and the events foretold, as well as to reveal and bring them to pass. The strong angel goes on a universal search and discovers that no angel, no created being, no human being, no creature, no spirit, no one can open the scroll. And I have to say to you this morning that we have people who are looking all over this world to try to find someone who's able to be the authoritative word of God to them. We have people in every direction that you can imagine. And the only thing they will not do is they will not recognize who Jesus Christ is. But they'll find any other excuse they can use to do that with. This search through heaven becomes futile. And this futile search crushes John's heart. He dissolved emotionally. The future of the world seemed too bleak to face. So in 5 and verse 4, John acknowledges then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. John's crushed. He knew there would be somebody who could give the word, somebody who had the authority, someone who had the power to go into this book. And his continually weeping reflected his sorrow that God's future kingdom and final judgment seemed to be indefinitely postponed. Because no one had the authority. No one had the power. John, John understood if no man could open the scroll, none of God's purposes would come to pass. The sad truth is without Christ, there's only weeping everywhere. The second thing I want you to notice here is Jesus will carry out God's final purposes. Suddenly in verse 5, after all this weeping that John goes through, suddenly in verse 5, he, we hear this, stop weeping. Behold, the line that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has come as to open the book and its seven seals. One of the 24 elders comes over. They comfort John with the news that Jesus Christ would open the scroll. He achieved victory 
victory over all of God's enemies and therefore had the authority to open the scroll and release its contents. It says he was the line of, from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. These are Old Testament names for the Messiah, the one who is coming in great power one day. The root of David, the tribe of Judah. This told us, give us identification as who this was, as God's ultimate anointed one. Jesus alone possessed the authority necessary for this task. He overcame Satan, he overcame sin, he overcame death, and he overcame the grave. So that he could implement God's purposes for the future as revealed in the scroll. Only God, through Christ, can make this happen. Eagerly, John turns his head. He's looking to see the Lion King now, right? That's his anticipation. But when he turns and looks, he's not prepared for what he sees. Instead of a kingling lion, the apostle sees something totally different. <clears throat> Chapter verse 6. Between the throne, the four living elders, and the elders, a lamb was standing. Now he's looking for a lion. And he finds a lion standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Now that's a strange lamb to be getting with God. So can I? You've got to remember there's a lot of imagery here in the book of Revelation. We'll get to that in just a minute. Seven eyes and seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. I want you to notice four things about this verse. First, John sees the Messiah as a lamb. The lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ in his first advent, meek and submissive to a sacrificial death as our substitute. I, there's, a, there's a difference here in the two Greek words that are used for lamb. The lesser word is used here for lamb. It refers to the sacrificial lamb of Passover. You know what was special about that lamb of Passover? That shows that one little lamb <coughs> in the And for one year, that lamb lived in the house with him. It was the family pet. It was with him everywhere they went. And so that when that lamb was slain, they would feel the sorrow and the hurt, the pain that it took. And we begin to understand the future ramifications. Isaiah 53 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before a shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. That's, that's the passage that begins to trip up every Jew that's ever lived. They don't want a lamb. They want a lion. But God said, I'm coming as a lamb anyway. In John, the first chapter of John, when John the Baptist saw Christ coming by, he said, look and behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb is a symbol of Jesus and His second coming. Powerful and aggressively judging the word in judgment. John saw the Lamb now in the center of all the creatures and elders gathered around the throne as the central character and most important person in this heavenly scene. Later in Revelation 7, 17, John sees this. He says, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He is, first of all, the lamb. Secondly, he's the lamb that was slain. The word slain here in the Greek means to cut up and mutilate an animal sacrifice. It speaks of a violent, bloody death. It describes the gory crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. As thorns pierced his skull, as a whip lacerated his back, as fists bruised his face. As nails gouged his hands and his feet, the spear tore through his side, and blood and water came gushing out, and Christ paid the ultimate price for mankind. It's a lamb that was slain. But the third thing here is the lamb standing. The lamb standing. The lamb who was violently slaughtered and put to death is actually standing. Having been killed, he is alive again and is standing in the innermost circle next to the throne. They thought they had killed him. They thought they'd done away with him. They had done up with him no more. But the third day, he came out. He could not be held back. And so the Lamb is standing, even in heaven. Even as he was slain here, he stands for all eternity. Yeah. As the Lamb that was slain. The fourth thing is this. The Lamb is awesome with his seven horns and his seven eyes. The number seven, seven in the Bible, and especially in Revelation is full of numbers. You find them all through the book. The number seven represents the fullness of Christ's power in defeating his foes. The horn is a biblical symbol of power and authority. The seven eyes represent the fullness of Christ's divine wisdom and discernment. 
Zechariah 4.10 says this, Who dares despise the day of small things, since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hands of Zerubbabel. His eyes are the seven spirits of God and the seven manifestations of the Spirit that communicate to Christ all that transpires. If you don't want to understand that, look at Isaiah 11, verses 2 through 4. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions to the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with a rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. So there's the seven eyes that has. The Lamb is an all-knowing as well as all-powerful. This is the one Lamb who can't have the wool pulled over his eyes. I'm sorry, I just couldn't get that. <laughs> Sometimes it just happens, you know. There's no more dreadful thoughts than to have to face the line in judgment because you rejected the Lamb. The purpose of the Lord's first coming was gracious. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. But the purpose of His second coming is different. Then He comes to deal with His enemies and to fulfill His promises of blessing His own. My friends, do not reject the grace of God. There comes a time when all men must deal with the Lamb. Either as the one for whom we have watched and worked and prayed for, or the one in whom we have rejected. Don't reject the line. What we have in Revelation 5 is a vision of Christ and the expanding concentric circles of His worship in heaven. First we see the worship of Jesus Christ in heaven by those immediately around the throne. We'll get there. Then we see the worship throughout all heaven. Finally we see worship throughout the entire universe like the wave in a football game that spreads and spreads to all creation. And it leads us to this third point which is Jesus Christ is worth, worthy of overwhelming praise from all of us. Amen. Now, I want you to understand something. I know people like church quiet, be, be restful and respectful, and silence and all that stuff. <laughs> this is the quietest world you're ever going to live in. This is the quietest world you're ever going to be in. Health that says there, down there there's weeping and wailing the gnashing of teeth. It's a noisy place. And they're not in quiet heaven when they start praising. I want you to listen to what's going to happen when people in heaven start praising God. Because it's not just a few that are going to do this. When he, Jesus, had taken the book of the four living creatures, and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayer of the saints. This transfer resulted in an outpouring of praise for the Lamb because it signaled that Christ would begin the judgment. While the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders prostrated themselves in worship, only the elders had harps and bowls. They used the harps to praise God throughout the Bible. But one instrument that's used over and over and over again to praise God is a harp that brings glory and honor to God through the harp. I don't think they didn't have, you know, had to be three horns back then, I don't guess. All those other things. I, I was worried about getting saxophones to do with it personally, but that's it. But we're using all the instruments to praise God, and they'll all be used in heaven. Here on earth we must do the same. John explained the bowls contain the prayers of God's people that are as a fragrant aroma of burning incense to Him. In the Old Testament, the priest would take bowls of incense and burn it as an offering up to God, as a praise offering. You ever get tired of hearing people pray sometimes? You ever get stuck with that and say, oh my gosh, we'll have another prayer. That, I wish, wish they'd hear you get this done. It takes me a long <laughs> You ever go to sleep during a prayer? Yeah. <laughs> we had a deacon in my home church, Mr. Oliver, praying three, three syllables at a time. Our Father, who art in heaven today, <laughs> be with us, your children. <laughs> and we have this kind of a negative attitude to a prayer. And the reason we have the negative attitude to a prayer is we can't see it from God's side. When God sees your prayers, when God hears prayers, you know what he pictures them as? As the smell of sweet burning incense. 
It's incense to God. He loves to hear the prayers of his people. This is what they did in the Old Testament. This is what's happened in heaven now as the prayers of the people are coming there. And then in John 5, in, in 5, 9 and 10, John goes and records that. They sang a new song. I wonder what it's going to sound like. I wonder what it's going to feel like to sing a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. As a result of the Lamb's authority from God to advance God's plan of the ages, the living, el the living creatures, the elders sang a new song. In this song, the Lamb receives honor for being worthy in view in view of all things. So let's look at four things from this. First, there's his death. He was slain. Second, the reason for his praise is he is worth, the lamb is worthy because he purchased. He redeemed for God by death his people from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. Salvation is not just for the Jews. Salvation is just not for the Europeans or the Americans. It's not for just the black, the white, the red, or the yellow. It's for everybody from all nations. Amen. And you and I have a responsibility to share that message with all people. Amen. It doesn't change. He said, Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. This is an innumerable host of angels that come to sin there. Now, we translate this in different ways in different places. The Greek word here is myriad. And myriad means 10,000. Now, if you have a myriad times a myriad or 10,000 times 10,000, I worked it out on the calculator. It's 100 million. A hundred million. But wait a minute. See, it didn't say myriad times myriad. It said myriads times myriads. So you got to apply a hundred million by another ten thousand and another ten thousand. And we're talking at this point about a multitude. We're talking about billions of angels that are standing there singing that day. We sometimes think of heaven as a small little cove that we go into there. But heaven is so vast and so wide and so numerous, there will be billions of angels who come that day who are singing praise, worthy Amen. is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. He says there are still thousands of thousands in addition to the billions. So 1,000 times 1,000 is a million. But it's the plural again. So multiplied millions spilling over the billions of worshipers already counted. This staggering number exceeds the limit of human language and our ability to comprehend. Multiplied millions are in this heavenly choir worshiping in heaven. Is that going to be a choir or is that going to be a choir? It's going to be full. In 512, the angels use seven expressions. Now remember the perfect number is seven. And it is significant to indicate the wonder of the Lamb. The rep repetition of and, the report of Kai, between each quality brings special emphasis to each one individually. These characteristics of which Jesus is worthy are things he has already possessed in heaven. Therefore, the song of praise, which the angels are singing, implies that he is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll in order to gain these on earth, even as he already possesses them in heaven. Now, understand the song is of earthly power, riches, wisdom. The events of chapter 6 through 19 actually bring these things to pass. But look real quickly with me. First it says he's worthy to receive power. Dudamas. It's mentioned first perhaps because the immediate situation calls for the need of great power to accomplish his purpose in the earth. He alone, as the perfect God-man Savior, is worthy of such power. For he alone can use it with perfect justice Inequality. It says he's worthy to receive power and riches. Plutus. Refers to the wealth of the universe. All this is his by creation and now by redemption and reformation. He's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom. Refers to the Lord's omniscience 
and its wise use in carrying out the purposes of God and the world. And might refers to the working might of power in action and stresses his omnipotence to carry out God's will. And honor refers to the esteem, the value and respect he is due because he is Christ, he is the God man. And glory, doxa, refers to the tribute and public display of an adoration that should occur to Christ. Again, this stems from his person in the work, both past, present, and future, and blessing. Our passage closes with this universal praise to the Father and the Son in verses 13 and 14. Where John writes, And every created thing which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and all its things and the sea, and all things in them, I heard them say, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessed, and honor, and glory, and dominion forever and forever and forever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. The elders fell down and worshipped him. In this vision, John heard every created thing. You know, there's going to come a day when every created thing sings praise to God. I don't understand it. I want to be there when Mount Rushmore starts talking to me. <laughs> I want to be around when the sea starts talking. When the animals start talking, this says that everything in creation, everything in creation, that includes to the Greek, when you press it out of the Greek, everything, you know what that means? It means everything. It means all of it. Everything in creation that day will sing praise to Jesus Christ. And they will, the stones, the birds, the animals, and the fish will all cry out. Because all creation has been groaning under the fall utility of the curse from Genesis. And now they know that they're about to be set free at last. The sequence of praise shows the first two are addressed to God, the next two to the Lamb, the last one to both. It is God who is praised as the Creator. It is the Son who is praised as the Reconciler of creation. Thus every living creature praises the Father and the Son there. One of the weaknesses today is that many people want to worship God but they don't want to worship Jesus. Yet the Father said there is no life apart from Him. Our passage concludes as the worship culminates in John's vision with the four creatures saying, Amen, repeatedly. And after the vast cry fell silent, the elders are seen worshiping by prostrating themselves before God's throne. Because He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of anything that we can give because He is the Lamb that was slain. The boy once captured two of birds and put them in a cage. A man saw the boy carrying the cage and asked him what he was going to do with the birds. Oh, the boy said, I'm going to play with them for a while and then feed them to my cat. The man looked at the birds and took pity on them and said, Say, I'd like to buy the cage and the birds from you. How much do you want for them? The boy thought for a minute and then he named his price. The man paid it. The boy handed over the cage, after which the man immediately opened the cage and set the birds free. That's what Jesus did for us. He paid the price. He went to Calvary. And when he said, when he had promised and when he purchased us with his blood, he set us free. If you do not know that freedom of Jesus Christ, 